Meet Me in the Bathroom is a 2023 film based on the 2017 book of the same name by Lizzie Goodman. It's the definitive account of the resurgent New York music scene at the dawn of the new millennium, as bands like The Strokes, Interpol, Yeah Yeah Yeahs and LCD Sound System reshaped the sound of American indie music. The book's author, Lizzie Goodman, moved to New York City in 1999 and met a guy at work called Nick Valenci, who told her he played guitar in a band and they were just starting out playing shows. They were called The Strokes. Just like California in the late 60s, a group of like-minded friends hung out, formed bands, blew up and got the world's attention. Lizzie writes in the intro to her book, when you ask people whose art it has gone on to matter to millions what it was like to be there in the beginning, they'll often tell you, there was nothing mythical or portentous about it at all. It was just the way life unfolded. It was a time that felt dizzying, though it turned out to be the calm before the many storms of the new millennium. September 11th, then came the frenetic remaking of New York and all the weird new phenomena of the rising 21st century, the internet, the iPod, Facebook and Twitter, the colonisation of Brooklyn. In the late 90s, the couple year period before all these changes really began, the music scene in New York had a giddy feel to it. We sensed something important had been unleashed. We were all chasing New York City. And for a few magical years, we caught it. This was indeed a magical moment in music history, probably set to be the last rock and roll happening of its kind, because it was just on the cusp of the mass adoption of the internet, when record sales were healthy, MTV still attracted large audiences, and there was a powerful music press that could sell hundreds of thousands of copies of magazines each week. Rent was still relatively cheap in places like Brooklyn, with a lot of warehouse space available, and New York was crying out for new voices. What I found so wildly exciting about the film of Meet Me in the Bathroom is seeing the behind the scenes footage and realizing just how young these bands were, all in their very early 20s and creating incredible art while having the time of their lives. Their hedonism only increased in the wake of 9-11 when their existence tomorrow no longer seemed guaranteed. So why not quit your job and start a band? There's a perfect snippet of conversation captured in, in a lift between members of the AAS. What's more important? Good sound or a good time? Sounding good, having a good time. In the 90s, guitar music had moved to the West Coast, to Seattle and LA. New York's 70s moment had well and truly played out. And while it was an incredibly exciting time for hip hop and electronic music, guitar music was in the doldrums. Grunge had hit its peak and ushered in the new metal era. And in the UK, bands like Coldplay and Travis dominated the radio. I mention the UK because it plays a pivotal role in this story. The British music press, particularly the NME, heavily promoted this new wave of bands, even featuring the Strokes on the front cover, before they'd even released a single. It was reading my older brother's copies of the NME that I first learned about these bands and heard their records. New York bands toured the UK and for the most part found large receptive audiences. The Strokes singer and songwriter Julian Casablancas spoke about the UK's love for the band in an interview with NME. England's got this special place in my heart. If it wasn't for everyone over here, I'd still be working in a bar. In late August 2001, the Strokes released their debut album, Is This It, in the UK. Young Brits were fascinated by the glamour of these handsome, stylish New Yorkers and lapped it up in droves. The album placed at number two in the UK album chart and the Strokes moved to headline festival shows in a matter of months. They blew up and they blew up so quickly. Recorded at Transportarium Studios in Manhattan's East Village with producer Gordon Raphael during March and April 2001, it was released to universal critical acclaim and named the best album of 2001 by multiple publications. I caught up with Gordon to talk about his new memoir, The World Is Going To Love This, where he describes first meeting the band, working with them on their EP and first two albums, and the trials of translating Julian Casablancas' vision into reality. I got to New York in 1998 um, in the spring, and pretty soon, within a few months, I was ha had a studio that I was working in, and within a year, I started becoming a producer that people came and I recorded bands, which is all unplanned. I just wanted to record my own stuff, but living in New York, my finances went quickly down to zero, and suddenly, at the right moment, bands started asking me to record them. And so, wow, I can survive in New York. And um, I don't know, I, it was a year later, it was in 2000, 
um, that I met the Strokes like around October or something like that, September, late September. And then I wound up staying up until like 9-11, you know, when the Strokes record was about to come out. And then I had an opportunity to go to England. I would love to just hear more about how you discovered the Strokes. And I do understand that you were going to a gig. Yeah, I mean... There were two bands playing that night, and the first one really hit me hard. Like, wow, I love this music. I want to record them, and I gave them my business card. And then this other band came on, and they were very young, and they were the Strokes, uh, playing for 45 or 50 people at the Luna Lounge in New York. And I thought, wow, they seem so stylish and proud of themselves, and they're so young. But I didn't really get the music. I didn't really feel it or hear it clearly for some reason. But then when I saw the other, the two guitar players go back on stage to get the, collect their pedals and fold their guitar straps and stuff like that, I went to them and said, hey, I have a studio really close by. I do really cheap demos. Try me out. You'll like it. And uh, Albert came over and checked out my studio and he liked the look of it. And so he ran home to Julian and said, we should record with this guy. And we made the demo that became the Modern Age EP. When you look back at that now, how does it make you feel? Well, looking back, even looking at back seven months later is the same as now. Well, now I wouldn't have known seven months later that it was going to last for 20 years But seven months later, there was so much excitement about that EP that it was like, wow, you just never know what's going to take off. And no one expected guitar rock music to have a chance in New York City. And now there's like limos around the block trying to sign the band. This is insane. So looking back now, it's obviously the most magical door. And it was a total blessing and a setup where I walk into a club trying to check out a party because I wanted to see how the booking agent was. And then I I make the Strokes record, the first record with those guys, which opens a door for both of us to go in a new way. <laughs> in, in the book, uh, you very um, amazingly remembered everything that Julian had ever said to you. And I have I have got notes because there are so many of them. Um, that are just so exquisite. So he said to you, imagine you're in a spaceship and you travel to the future where you discover a great band from the past that you really love. And, and, and you deciphered that. Somehow, I mean, it went in combination with what Fab said, which was a little clearer to me. He said, hey, you know what everybody's doing in New York right now? Well, that's what we don't want to do, you know. So, okay, mm, okay, what what's everybody doing? They're using every new computerized trick to make the biggest productions that the world has ever heard. So if you want to do the opposite, I have eight microphones and you can just go in there and record, you know, play your song and I'll record it on eight microphones and that'll be your sound, you know. So a combination um, is what led me down the path. It wasn't exactly everything that Julian said, but what he said was so interesting all the time and so abstract. And some of the things he said were more understandable. Like, for example, he'd say, Gordon, it sounds like the whole drum set is at a party having the time of their lives and the hi-hat is waiting outside and he can't get in. Can you fix that? As the big band of the time, the Strokes are the main focus of the documentary, but Meet Me in the Bathroom also features thrilling dives into some of the other key bands of the era, namely Interpol, Yeah Yeah Yeahs and LCD Sound System. Karen O of the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, hands down the iconic frontwoman of that era, gave her performances everything with no regard for her own safety. Often performing while highly intoxicated, she nearly died after falling off the stage and being crushed by a monitor. She played subsequent shows from a wheelchair while she recovered. Her incredible charisma and refusal to engage with the barrage of misogynistic questions from music industry journalists paved the way for other front women to step forward and take centre stage. It's a powerful moment and thrilling footage. 
James Murphy, co-founder of the influential DFA Records and later frontman of LCD Sound System, is another key figure in this story. His force of nature alpha personality and refusal to compromise on his singular creative vision, one that fused the angular guitars of German kraut rockers can with elements of funk, house and techno, took his band from scrappy outsider to Grammy winner with a number one album for 2017's excellent American Dream. He bridged the gap between rock and electronic music and has had a seismic influence on artists as diverse as Nine Inch Nails, Hot Chip and the 1975. He got to work with his hero, David Bowie. The band were named one of Rolling Stone's new immortals, described as currently active or relatively recently defunct artists who they think will stand the test of time. It's not a perfect film, and an hour and 45 minutes, it barely scratches the surface of the excellent book, but it's still a fascinating tale of glamour, excess, and immense talent. There's interband conflict, self-destruction, struggles with fame, and the pressures of following up perfect debut albums. What I love about this era is that it was so inspirational to so many people. It made them pick up guitars and say, let's start a band. It had a huge effect on the UK music scene, and you can see the New York influence in bands like Arctic Monkeys, Franz Ferdinand, The Libertines, and Block Party. Like all scenes, it didn't last. Gentrification came to Brooklyn and pushed the artists out. The music industry rushed to find the next new strokes, led to a lot of inferior music being released. Not everything from that era stands up to the test of time, but the first records by Yeah Yeah Yeahs, Interpol, The Strokes, TV on the Radio, Vampire Weekend, and LCD Sound System all still sound incredible. If you've not heard them, then you're in for a treat. Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video. I really, really appreciate it. Don't forget to watch the full interview with Gordon Raphael on Nebula. Oh, and talking of records, pre-order my upcoming debut album, Super Sexy Heartbreak. Loads of links in the description below to check out. But otherwise, I'll of course be seeing you here again very soon.